So, hi everybody. It is my honor and privilege for this Odafos seminar. I forgot which one we are now, the fourth, the third of the year. To receive Vincent Duhel from the CNRS, uh, where he works at the Institut d'Histoire et de Philosophie des Sciences et des Techniques of, in Paris. And without further ado, I will give him the floor. After his presentation, we'll take a five minute break. After that, I will have a brief comment to start the discussion. Please, thank you to have come. Thank you. Uh, in, in Belgium, train. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to Alexandre for his kind invitation, and I'm really happy to, to return to the ESP, uh, ESP where I spent very good years uh, as postdoc. So when Alexandre uh, let me know the, the theme of the, of the seminar, uh, I wasn't sure what I could present. For a few years, um, I, m I worked mostly on the question of the reduction of uh, thermodynamics and fluid mechanics on one side and statistical mechanics on the other. And I didn't immediately see how this uh, research could fit uh, into the, the theme. So I thought that going back to my work during my, my PhD devoted to the discrete representation of time in physics was, was more relevant for, for this seminar. Uh, and I have to say that a, a part of this talk is a, is a work in progress, so any comments will be, uh, will be welcome. So just a few words about the context of the, of the talk. So my PhD was on the philosophical analysis of discrete mechanics, which is a formulation of classical mechanics with a discrete time symbol. And in particular, I discussed um, if it was possible to dispense with a continuous representation of time in physics to do without a, time, a continuous time symbol, and what consequences we could do. I also investigated more, more practical uh, issues. Uh, I discussed whether uh, this discrete mechanics was preferable for computational physics, I mean, to to perform compu computer simulations. Uh, and these two kinds of questions are, are, re are re related to the twofold origin of discrete mechanics. On the one hand, uh, discrete, discrete mechanics was uh, developed, initially developed by the physicist uh, Tsung Dao Li uh, as a new physical theory. So Tsung, Tao, Tsung Dao Li is, an, is a Nobel Prize winner uh, for for, 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 for works in particle physics for the charge parity, charge parity uh, symmetry. And on the other hand, uh, discrete mechanics has also been developed as a computational mechanics to, to perform computer simulations in classical mechanics. So, and uh, this is partly due to the, to the mathematician uh, Gerald Martin. In this talk, I will leave uh, aside the computational aspects and I will focus on Lee's approach, which aims to, to develop a new discrete physical theory. Okay, now just a, a few words of introduction. So, here is uh, Lee's seminal paper, published in Physics Letters in 1983, Can Time Be a Discrete Dynamical Variable? And the abstract claims, the possibility that time can be regarded as a discrete dynamical uh, variable is examined through all phases of mechanics, from classical mechanics to non-relativistic quantum mechanics and to relativistic quantum field theories. So the project is quite ambitious. I mean, Lee aims to offer a discrete reformulation of physical theories from classical to quantum physics. In another paper, we can read a different perspective on, on this project, uh, I assume. For more than three centuries, we have been influenced by the precept that uh, fundamental laws of physics should be expressed in terms of differential equations. Different equations are always regarded as approximations. Here, I try to explore the opposite. Different equations are more fundamental, and differential equations are regarded as approximations. So Newton uh, claimed in, in his Principia that time is continuous and classical mechanics and actually all physics then grounded on this assumption. And afterwards, use differential equations to express the fundamental laws of, uh, of physics. 
Lee suggests starting from a discrete time variable and expressing all the fundamental equations of physics with different equations. <coughs> and a few years later, uh, Lee proposed to, to go even further and reformulate in a discrete way not only classical quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, but also a theory of quantum gravi gravitation. So far, my, my research has been limited to the first step of Lee's project, uh, namely classical mechanics. But I also try to investigate the discrete representation of time in these more fundamental theories, particularly quantum mechanics and quantum gravity. So, time is uh, usually represented as continuous in physics, classical mechanics, electro electromagnetism, hydrodynamics, relativity, quantum mechanics, and so on. And by a continuous representation, I mean using the, the mathematical symbol T, defined on real numbers, interval. Lee, on the other, on the other hand, tries to, to treat time as, uh, as discrete. He uses the, the a, a symbol TK, which runs uh, through a finite set of elements. Each uh, instant TK is indexed by a natural number K. Okay. So I have two main claims in this talk. First, I will argue that the continuous representation of time is not mandatory in physics. It's not necessary. And consequently, I will argue that it's a theoretical framework that physicists can choose to describe phenomena. But the discrete representation of time is another perfectly good theoretical framework. Physicists can choose one framework or the other. Secondly, I will argue that Lee's discrete physics series fit well with a somehow relationist conception of time, namely the, the conception that time does not exist by, by itself. At least, I will argue that the time symbol does not play the same role in Lee's discrete uh, theories compared to the usual or uh, to the classical and quantum uh, mechanics. The time symbol is no longer the parameter responsible for the evolution of physical systems in, in these discrete uh, theories. Okay, so first I will start by presenting uh, some general stuff on time and physics before turning in section two to, to my claim that one can do without a continuous representation of time. And the next three sections, so section three, four, and five, are then devoted to three discrete physical theories. And, and the purpose of these uh, sections is first to support the claim one. Uh, I mean, we can reformulate uh, physical theories with a discrete time symbol. Moreover, leaving aside the question of discreteness, uh, I will also analyze the role of the time symbol uh, in this series, and as I said, I will show that it's not an evolution parameter for physical systems. So, to start with, uh, why should we pay attention to the, to the representation of time in physics? A task in, in the philosophy of science is to analyze and clarify the notion of time in, uh, in physical theories. Why? because we usually consider that, phys that physics has something to say about time. And following uh, Wilfrim Seller's distinction between the manifest image of the world and the scientific image, Craig Callender distinguishes between manifest time and physical time. Manifest time is uh, the concept uh, of time that comes from a common sense picture of the world informed by our sensible experience. It's a notion of time that we probably inherit from uh, childhood, and some of its features are, for example, that the present is special, time flows, the past is fundamentally different from the future, time is ordered, one-dimensional, continuous, absolute. Uh, so continuity is a, is a feature of the manifest time. Of course, that's the one in which I am interested in. In contrast, physical time is a notion informed by our physical theories, Newton and mechanics, uh, special and general relativity, and so on. And even if, if uh, no a single concession of, of time arises from uh, a study of physics, 
uh, Craig Callender claims that there is a clash between manifest time and physical time. He says physical time departs dramatic dramatically from manifest time. No physical theory has ever required the properties characteristic of manifest time. For example, like according to our physical theories, <coughs> the present is not special for calendar. Classical physics, uh, Einsteinian physics do not posit a special now. Similarly, there is no a temporal flow in physical theories according to Craig, to Craig calendar. There is no past future asymmetry at the microscopic level. Uh, most of the equations of physics are time universal invariant. So that's why Craig Callender argues that if we assume that physical time is our best theory of time, then it turns, it turns out that manifest time paints a very misleading image of time. This claim might be uh, controversial, but at least even if uh, in our ordina ordinary life uh, we tend to consider to regard time as continuous, I claim that, that we should be careful about the question whether physical time is continuous. I would like to, to stress another distinction that is important for, for to the talk. Uh, we should distinguish between time, more precisely physical time, and the representation of time. The distinction is not, al this distinction is not always made in the literature. And it is absent, perhaps, because it is implicitly admitted, uh, but it's a, it's a way of loosely speaking. When we, when we say time, we uh, actually say the representation of time, or time symbol. Or, in contrast, it is absent uh, because there is a, an assumption, an endorsed assumption about time, the assumption according to which the representation of time mirrors time and its features. I will go back to, to this point below in the talk. In any case, there are different ways to represent time in, physics, in physical theories. So usually, time is represented with the, types, type, with the symbol T, a continuous parameter. But in Galileo's or, or Newton's text, for example, we have uh, geometrical quantities. Time is represented by a segment. And this, on these figures, uh, AC and CI and IO uh, segments. And as I said, we can also represent time with a discrete symbol. Here's, here is an example where the distinction is not made. Uh, it's a quotation of calendar. We can read about the question of the dimensionality of, of time that in classical physics, assuming that the instant of time form a continuum, blah, 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 the set of instants is topologically one dimensional. So how, we sh how should we understand the sentence, the instance of time from a continuum? In this case, I guess it's a way of speaking. Calendar actually speaks about the time symbol, but not about time per se. And the reason is that calendar leaves elsewhere open the question uh, of the structure of time. Uh, I quote him, is time this or dense or continuous is not a question like are quarks ontologically more basic than protons? We don't yet have a physical theory, empirically well confirmed, uh, which tells us what is the structure of time. While we have physics theories uh, on, the of the structure of, on the structure of protons. So, how should we interpret time symbols in physics? Here are some possibilities uh, that I see. First, the continuous representation of time might be an idealization, like, for example, uh, the continuous representation of mass density in fluid mechanics. But no, I don't think so. We have to exclude this possibility because an idealization is uh, an hypothesis that we know to be false, but we use, we, we use it for practical reasons. We know that fluids are made of molecules, but we don't know if time is continuous or discrete. It's not a, literally a, a false assumption. The second possibility is the representation of time could refer to physical content. It would mean that the structure of time would be an, empiri an empirical question. Maybe, however, in the current state of science, this question is not uh, confirmed, is not, uh, and at best it, it's, a, it's a physical hypothesis. The third possibility, the continuous representation of time as metaphysical content. 
So in that case, the structure of time is not an empirical question. And the last possibility is that uh, the continuous representation of time is a neutral theoretical framework. It's a viewpoint that could be attributed to, to Carnap and his uh, successors. According to this account, the continuous representation of time is somewhat conventional. I will go back to this, uh, to this account uh, later. For now, let's suppose that we can replace our continuous representation of time with a discrete one. What would be the consequences of, this, uh, of dispensing with, this, uh, with a continuous representation of time? What would it change? To, to tackle these questions, I will use what is, uh, to my knowledge, the, the only reference in the philosophy of science that directly, precisely addresses uh, this question. It's in the, the, stru the Structure of Time by uh, William Newton Smith, a Canadian philosopher who was uh, in Oxford. He notably defends the, the thesis that if we could dispense with the continuous representation of time in physics by replacing it with a discrete one, then we would have at least as much reason to regard time as discrete as we now have for regarding it as continuous. And I would like to, to discuss this, this claim. First, what does it mean by time is continuous and time is discrete? I quote him, if time is continuous, the set of all instants will be isomorphic to the real, the real numbers. So Newton Smith uh, endorses a set theoretic uh, definition uh, of time. Of course, such a conception is criticized, notably by Michael Demet, who suggests that continuous time should not be conceived as a set of elements. This is related to the view of Hermann Weil, uh, from whom uh, I quote, there is no point in the jelly of continuums, of the continuum. And we can also mention some <coughs> recent related discussions by Nicolas Gisin, but this, in, this is not my point, I, uh, and I put aside these questions, these, discuss these discussions. Similarly, Newton Smith defines discrete time as a set of instants, isomorphic now to a finite sub subset of natural numbers. I will not also enter into discussion about this definition. And for discussion on discrete time, uh, see, for example, the chapter of the handbook uh, of the philosophy of time uh, by Jean-Paul von Bendegem for discrete time. Here, I would like to, to stress an important point in, in Newton Smith's claim. For me, he implicitly adopts a holistic confirmation for statements about time. To the question, why do we tend to regard time as continuous, he says, it's <coughs> quite simply that the best physical theories we have in fact construct of the physical world require, in their mathematical formulation, a time parameter that ranges over the elements of the real number system. So in other words, using a continuous time symbol, a continuous representation of time in our best physical theories is a good reason for believing that time is continuous. As I will discuss, discuss below, we, will might, we, we, we might disagree with this uh, methodological criteria. But for now, for now let's continue with, with uh, Newton Smith's discussion. So, with this holistic uh, criterion, let's assume that physical theories with a discrete and continuous parameter would be empirically equivalent. And I will argue for this claim later in the talk. So in that case, we could not decide between these two theories. We would face an undecidability result uh, from which Newton Smith then argues for two options. On the one hand, time is continuous and time is discrete can be interp interpreted as inaccessible, inaccessible empirical statements. So time is generally continuous or discrete, it's an empirical fact, but we cannot know if it if it, if it is continuous or uh, discrete. On the other hand, time is continuous and time is discrete can also be interpreted as non-empirical statements. And in that case, continuity or discreteness of time are not empirical facts. They are theoretical frameworks used to describe empirical facts. So Newton Smith considers two possibilities among the three I mentioned uh, Previously, the representation of time might refer to physical content, 
it is an empirical question, or it should be viewed as a neutral theoretical framework. And actually, he is inclined to, the, to, to this option three. And as Newton Smith acknowledge, acknowledges, he follows Carnap's view on time. For Carnap, the question about the existence and the features of time, space, and space-time are indeed questions about the choice of, use, of using such or such linguistic framework to describe a physical phenomena. Therefore, since uh, Newton Smith lies on Carnap's uh, analysis, it's not very surprising that he does not consider option two that statements of a time have metaphysical content. So I mostly agree with uh, Newton Smith's analysis. <coughs> Nevertheless, I argue that we should amend this, uh, this view. And the main reason is that I disagree with his holistic confirmation criterion. In contrast, uh, I follow uh, Penelope Maddy's analysis. She claims that also physicists widely use a continuous representation of time. They still consider the question of its continuity as an open question. I quote her, mathematical existence assumptions in science and their accompanying assumptions about the structure of physical reality, such as time and space, are not treated on an epistemic par with ordinary physical assumptions. The standards of their introduction are weaker and their role in successful theory lacks, lacks confirmatory force. So in other words, Madi denies holistic confirmation for assumptions about the structure of time. One needs uh, empirical investigations on, on the structure of time to believe uh, uh, in statements on time. I mean, we need scientific... What does she mean by the structure of time? It's metric? Uh... Um, it's all... Uh, all, sta all statements on, on, the, the, uh, on time, so... Does the topology... I, 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 she, she, actually, in this, uh, in this quotation, she, the, the context of this quotation is um, the discussion about continuity uh, on time and or discreteness, and she... she uh, it's not very... Yeah, yeah. But... Mm, yeah, in, 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 in this, uh, in this yeah, the, conce the context of this quotation is uh, uh, just continuity. Uh, uh, but I, but I think we could extend to... continuous representation, okay, that, that's granted in the, in the context of this discussion. So what would be open to the physicist uh, as to the uh, structure of time? It's metric, it's topology, maybe is it an open time, closed time? Uh, I don't know. Yes, uh, I think uh, all these uh, these possibilities are are, are, are okay. Uh, no, there is no specific. Uh, she doesn't. Yeah, she she does she she, she she does not specify what kind of uh, of structure of time she has, she has in mind. But but what she what uh, what she says is that one needs specific <coughs> inquiries that are specifically dedicated to uh, this question. So the question of uh, topology of time, of, uh, of uh, discreteness of time, of, of granularity of times. And if we don't have uh, empirical investigation on specific statement, we, we, should, not, uh, we should not argue for uh, this or one or the other structure of time. So, consequently, I, I argue for amending Newton Smith's account by restricting the consequences to the representation of time and not by jumping to statements on time. And in that case, uh, I defend that the continuous representation of time and the discrete uh, have to be interpreted as theoretical frameworks, which can be equally used in physics. So, the representation, representation of time and not time itself. Using one or the other is a question of choice, it's a matter of decision. Nevertheless, this claim crucially depends on an assumption that I didn't support yet. I have assumed that we can reformulate our best physical theories with a discrete time parameter, and I have assumed that these theories are empirically equivalent, and the, the rest of the talk will address this, uh, this assumption. But before that, just a, a last word. Uh, even if you disagree with uh, Maddy's objection, 
and if you rather agree with uh, Newton Smith, the, the, the rest of the talk is also interesting for you since uh, in that case it will support the claim that the continuity of time and the discreteness of time are two theoretical frameworks. So let's begin with uh, classical mechanics, discrete classical mechanics. It's the first step in Lee's account for discrete <coughs> physics. So it's generally admitted that, it, that it's impossible to formulate classical mechanics without a continuous time symbol. In particular, the, the fundamental laws are differential equations, which require a continuous time symbol, and the formulation of classical mechanics with difference equations seems generally impossible. According to, the, to Adolf Grunbaum, a physical theory whose fundamental laws take the form of difference equation is, at best, a gleam in the eyes of Hopwood's speculative theoreticians. So he is not very optimistic. <laughs> However, uh, I will, we will see that this statement is no longer true. Today, classical mechanics can be formulated with, with a discrete time symbol. So there are dozens of discrete classical mechanics, actually. It's a research topic in itself to ask, to ask which one is the best. Uh, I will consider the formulation that I believe to be preferable, which is to our least discrete uh, classical mechanics. Why? <coughs> because it's, it's the most satisfactory in the sense that it maximizes the, the number of conservation laws that we have in the usual classical mechanics, the one with uh, continuous time sample. <coughs> there is indeed a theorem due to uh, G and Marsden in 1988, which guarantees that to, to, maximi to maximize these conservation laws, the number of, of the conservation laws, we must use a discrete representation of time applied to a variational approach of classical mechanics. <coughs> and I believe this is a very important theorem overlooked in the philosophical literature. So for example, Donald Greenspan also produced a discrete classical mechanics in the 70s, which finds the conservation of energy, conservation of momentum. Nevertheless, the, conserva the conservation of the area of, uh, in the phase space was lost. And indeed, it was not actually a discrete mechanics based on the variational approach. So what is uh, variational mechanics? Uh, it's, it's a reformulation of Newtonian mechanics as a theory of variational principles, and notably based on the least action principle. This reformulation is partly due to Lagrange, uh, and, it, and, it is a, and it is a very important achievement in physics and mathematics, and Alexandre is, a, is an expert on, on Lagrangian mechanics. Roughly speaking, the idea is to describe the, the evolution of a physical system as the one that minimizes a quantity S called the action. Among all its possible evolutions, the actual evolution of a system is the one that minimizes uh, this action. This action is defined as, a, as, a, as an integral of, of a function, the, the, Lagran the, the Lagrangian L, a function of the position Q and the, the, the velocity Q prime, the time derivative of the position. So our least discrete mechanics is also based on the discrete least action principle. Similarly, a physical system will follow the evolution that minimizes a discrete action SD among all its possible evolutions. Uh, this discrete minimization principle leads to discrete Euler-Lagrange equations. So they are analogous to the usual Euler-Lagrange equation, which are the equations of motion in Lagrangian mechanics. And there is also an, another equation, which is the conservation of the discrete energy. I will not discuss in more detail this formulation. I have done this in a couple of papers. Here, I would like to, to point out that some systems can be solved solve exactly with, with, within discrete mechanics, I mean ana analytically. This is, for example, like, for example the case for the, for the free particle or the harmonic oscillator. We can take discrete equations of motion and solve them. And we can do physics with this, uh, with this equation and, and with these solutions. Okay. An important point for, for, for the talk uh, is that discrete mechanics is empirically equivalent to the usual continuous uh, classical mechanics. It's of course important to support Newton Smith's uh, claim, uh, undecidability claims about time symbols. Excuse me, but yes. I interrupt you. No. The 
how does he make the how does he make the calculations? Is he, can you speak louder? Uh, <coughs> how does he make the calculations? I mean, how does he find the solutions using a discrete time? What I mean, mean, he uses the usual tools of uh, the, uh, of calculus. Uh, yes. And, and then, but those uh, usual tools of calculus, you know, when you do in this context with the discrete time, uh, they they don't they, they shouldn't work because. I think the tools of, uh, uh, of, the, of the calculus presuppose that you know those quantities are continuous. Mm. So, so does he have an instrument, a uh, instrument uh, view of the, these uh, uh, um, computing tools and, uh, to find the solutions of those equations? No, uh, actually, I have discussed this uh, this point in, uh, in 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 some papers. I think we we should distinguish. Uh, between the representation of time and the use of uh, continuum, mat mathematical continuum. Um, so it's more instrumental than the exactly. use of uh, For example, the, the variable Q, QK, is a real number. Yeah, that's so a solution. You know, yes, okay. but, but the same with the equations. Uh, all, all variables here, even if they are discrete, they are real valued uh, quantities. So you can use all the continuum, uh, all the, the tools of uh, continuum math mathematics, even if you represent uh, discrete okay. variables. Okay. Thank you. So about empirical equivalence, uh, so we can argue for this empirical equivalence since um, I mean, we can argue for this empirical equivalence for if n, the number of steps, is sufficiently large, uh, since the discrete action tends to the continuous action in the limit when n goes to infinity. So this is the main reason for for, for empirical equivalence. If you if you if you have a large n, sufficiently large n, you can always uh, uh, you you can. You can have equations and there are solutions which are uh, the difference between the, the continuous equation and the discrete equations become empirically undetectable since they are always uh, measure measurement errors with a finite uh, accuracy. I have also discussed this empirical equivalence in, in other papers, so I will not spend more time on it today, but if you have questions, I, I can, we can discuss it uh, after. Uh, here, I would like to discuss another and actually novel point for, the, for this talk. This is actually the original part of the talk. Uh, Lee treats time as, I quote, a, a discrete dynamical variable. So it, I think it's pretty clear what he means by discrete. But what does he mean by dynamical variable? And I will show that dynamic, dynamical variable means coordinate in these discrete mechanics. And I will argue that this uh, treatment comes from the discretization of the, of the extended theory of Lagrangian mechanics. And I, I will argue that it's very important. Uh, and importantly, I will show that this representation of time fits very well with the relationist viewpoint of time. So what is the extended theory of Lagrangian mechanics? It's a generalization of the usual theory of Lagrangian mechanics, the one we find in textbooks for which time is treated on the same footing as positions, namely as a coordinate. And I think Jacobi uh, proposed, in the, proposed it in the 19th century. And here is how Jeremy Butterfield uh, talks, uh, talks about this uh, generalization. If one wishes, one can treat time in a manner more similar to the position of a particle. In both the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formalism, T is then treated uh, as one of the configuration, uh, as well as of configuration coordinate Q, all of which are functions of temporal parameter tau, tau say. So I am interested in Lagrangian mechanics, but we can do the same things with uh, Hamiltonian uh, mechanics. The idea is to introduce a new parameter, here's a Greek letter, the Greek letter tau, which describes the evolution of the system system which is now represented by the new coordinates Q 
plus time. And I think it's even better to remove the adjective uh, temporal about uh, tau. Uh, tau is not another time symbol, it's just a mathematical parameter. Uh, I will discuss it. So, with this uh, extending theory of uh, Lagrangian mechanics, a physical system is described by the coordinate Q, the, the position, and t and the time t. And the evolution of the system is parametri parametrized by tau. So here is the initial uh, state with uh, Q, uh, Q initial and initial uh, time. At the end, we have the final state. And you can describe all the states uh, by varying uh, the tau parameter. So in the traditional or usual Lagrangian series, the configuration space contains the position Q and its time derivative Q prime, the velocities. We can see uh, the configuration space in the Lagrangian, Q and Q prime. Now the configuration space is larger, is extended. It contains uh, the position Q, its derivative, we, with respect to the new parameter tau now, so dot Q. And also the time t and its derivative with respect to tau dot t. And if we have n particles in the system, we have a 6n dimensional configura configuration space in the traditional usual Lagrangian theory. In contrast, we have 6n plus 2 dimensional configuration space in the extended Lagrangian theory. An important feature is that the extended Lagrangian mechanics is invariant under parameterization or reparameterization. It means that if we take another parameter, or more precisely, if we modify the, the tau parameter by applying a continuous transformation which changes tau into tau prime, the action is and the, the equations of our motions are unchanged, they are not modified. In that sense, the, the tau parameter is a free gauge. And that's why we, we can consider that uh, tau has no physical meaning, and it's not a temporal parameter. Th this property is at the origin of debates in the philosophy of physics, since it leads to the, to the famous problem of time, or timeless physics. And this problem arises in attempts to unify quantum mechanics and general relativity. And I'm not going to, to discuss this problem, which is actually more concerned with the extended Hamiltonian mechanics. And I will focus on the extended Lagrangian mechanics. Before moving to the discrete case, because here we are in the continuous case, before moving to the discrete case, let me discuss the consequences of this new treatment of time in continuous mechanics. mechanics. I'm sympathetic to Karim Tebow's analysis uh, about uh, this uh, topic. According to him, the, ex the extended Lagrangian theory is a modification of the theory, of the usual Lagrangian theory, that more naturally allows for Leibnizian viewpoint. So what does it mean? Roughly speaking, we can usually oppose two conceptions of time. Uh, in a Newtonian view or substantialism, roughly speaking, time is conceived as an entity in itself, uh, responsible for the evolution of bodies. By contrast, in Leibnizian viewpoint, or relationism, time is not conceived as an, as an entity, it's just a succession of events. And Ernst, Ernst Marf, notably defending this point, uh, uh, this point of view, I, I said, uh, 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 is, uh, sorry, he said, time is an abstraction at which we arrive by means of the change, changes of things. So, what does Karim Tebow's, uh, Karim Tebow claim that uh, the extending theory uh, of Lagrangian mechanics leads to, uh, leads to, this, uh, to this view. The traditional or usual Lagrangian mechanics, as well as uh, the Newtonian mechanics actually, uh, is not spontaneously easy to interpret according to the Leibnizian viewpoint, and it fits rather well with the Newtonian viewpoint because the time symbol plays uh, a privileged role. Uh, I quote him, the problem with the traditional Lagrangian mechanics from the Leibnizian relational viewpoint is the one of excess temporal structure. Indeed, time symbol plays a central role. It's uh, the parameter that describes the evolution of physical systems. The position is a function of the, of the symbol t, is the action n is an integral with uh, the, the time symbol t. It's also involved in the definition of velocities, which are derivative with, with respect to, to time. 
On the other hand, in the extended Lagrangian theory of time, uh, in the extended Lagrangian, Lagrangian theory, the time symbol t is no longer an evolution parameter, it's just a coordinate. And in that sense, it's a dynamical variable, such, such as uh, the position. And in addition, the, the tau parameter, uh, being uh, a, free, a free gauge, cannot be viewed as a, as a temporal evolution. So that, that's why the extending theory of Lagrangian mechanics fits well with the, fits better with, with the relationist uh, point of view. Time does not play a privileged role to be in a nutshell. So let's now return to the discrete case, to the discrete Lagrangian mechanics, I mean to least, to the least discrete mechanics. My point is that this discrete Lagrangian mechanics, mechanics is actually the discretization of the extended theory of Lagrangian mechanics. And this is why Tsung Daoli claims that he treats time as a discrete dynamical variable. The time symbol is a discrete coordinate. Uh, and the transition from the, from the continuous case to the discrete case is done by discretization of the, uh, of the tau parameter. The continuous parameter tau is replaced by a discrete parameter n. The position q and the time symbol t are then functions of this discrete parameter n, which describes all the states of the system in a discrete, uh, in a discrete manner. Accordingly, Tsung Daoli's discrete mechanics uh, too goes well with the relationist viewpoint of time. However, this uh, Leibnizian viewpoint is even more constrained in the discrete case compared uh, with the continuous uh, case. In the continuous case, we go from the usual Lagrangian mechanics to the extending one uh, without any modifications in the content of the equations of motion. In a sense, it's just a change of perspective, uh, which is very important for some purpose, but we have the same physics content. In contrast, in the discrete case, it's in a sense mandatory to adopt the, the extended Lagrangian mechanics to have good equations. Again, this follows from the G. Marsden theorem, which states that we lose some conservation laws if we don't adopt these discrete mechanics. So here is a, a non-trivial non observation. It's, it seems that the use of a discrete representation of time is not completely independent of our viewpoint on time, on the, on the relationist or substantialist debate on time. The Leibnizian viewpoint seems to follow from the discrete approach and from a good discrete approach with the good, uh, with the good equations with motion equations and conservation of energy. And a related point, in least discrete mechanics, there is no discrete time step, H, A, or Epsilon, call it uh, whatever you want. And this may, this may be surprising, since when we think uh, of the discretization of differential equations, we think of the discretization with, 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 a, with a time step. This is not the case here, and it's, a, it's related to the fact that we discretized the extended uh, theory of Lagrangian mechanics and not the usual Lagrangian mechanics. Here, there is just a sequence of coordinate, Qn and Tn, but no time step which governs the evolution of the system step by step. So this is again compatible with the Leibnizian viewpoint, uh, I think. If, if a time step H, uh, a discrete increment, Govern the evolution of the discrete dynamics, this time step could have been conceived in a Newtonian uh, viewpoint. Even discrete, but. Uh, um, and finally, from a theoretical point of view, we will see, but I'm not sure, uh, that this, this is a very valuable advantage, I mean, to not, uh, to not have a time step for more fundamental physical theories, particularly covalent loop quantum gravity. There is indeed only one parameter n to tend to infinity for the continuous limit and no time step parameter to tend to, to zero. I will skip this, uh, this slide uh, about um, invariance under parameterization in this case, in discrete case. And if I have 10 minutes, 5 minutes, uh, just a few words about uh, the quantum mechanics case. 
uh, which is <laughs> second step in this project uh, of discrete physics. Um, so maybe first let's have a look to the trajectories of our path in discrete classical uh, mechanics. So this path uh, on the left are piecewise continuous functions. Um, and we recover the continuous smooth path uh, with the continuous limit when, we, when n tends to infinity. And the transition to discrete, uh, to discrete quantum mechanics will be based on this notion of discrete path in classical mechanics. How? By using the path integral formalism of quantum mechanism, mechanics developed by, uh, by Feynman. Indeed, this, this formalism already allows us to go from classical to, to quantum mechanics. Um, the quantum probability for a particle uh, starting to some initial point zero to be at the finite point f is defined by considering all the possible paths, all the both classical paths between the two points. Um, so that's, that's, that's uh, what Lee states about the continuous case. Mm -hmm. When we go from classical to quantum mechanics, in the usual continuum theory, the particle takes on any smooth path. And he explains how he moves on to discrete quantum mechanics. In the corresponding discrete theory, we again restrict the particle to move only along the discrete path. Uh, so here is a figure that illustrates uh, Feynman's idea. So we have to consider all the, the paths between initial state and final state to, to define the transition amplitude. Um, and an important point for my, for my purpose is, is that to be able to compute the quantum probability, time has to be discretized in uh, Feynman paths uh, in integral formalism. Time is sliced with a discrete time uh, epsilon. Um, so, in, in Feynman path integral formalism, time has to be discretized, and at the end of the calculation, we take the continuous limit. Lee's discrete quantum mechanics. Yes? Um, so, in the last slide, you discretized the time as like the variable, but you made the distinction before that between time and the parametrization to and the Leibniz point of view was that you discretize the parameter to but not the time. Um, is that not kind of cheating and saying you discretize time but then you discretize to which is se explicitly separated from time? It's a very good question. Uh, actually, the Feynman pass integral formalism Yes, yeah, there, there is the time that it is yeah. but not, not necessarily the parametrization tool in between. I perfectly agree. Uh, Feynman pass integral formalism is not based on the extended uh, Lagrangian theory. It's based on the usual Lagrangian theory with uh, and t plays the role of uh, an evolution parameter. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, when Feynman uh, defines the pass integral, I mean at the beginning of his paper, he used all the classical uh, tools of Lagrangian theory, so that's why we have time and we discretize time. So we have in the we are here in the yeah, usual uh, uh, framework of Lagrangian mechanics. But you are perfect. You anticipate what I want to say. Uh, Lee's discrete Lee's, uh, Lee's quantum mechanics will be based on the the discrete version of the extended Lagrangian mechanics applied to path integral. But if we just focus on the, now uh, before on the Feynman framework, uh, we have exactly a discrete time with a time step epsilon. Uh, so I will skip some slides to be... Uh, mm. So I think you, you understood what I, what I wanted to say about uh, the, the, the least discrete quantum mechanics. Um, I want to, to discuss different things, but uh, one thing I would like to, to discuss is the fact that if we, if we focus on discrete Feynman pass integral, and not yet in uh, least discrete uh, quantum mechanics, 
Um, I would like to, to show that the discretization is crucial and even indispensable, even in the case of uh, the family pass integral. And after that, I would like to, to, to go to, to, I would like to move on to uh, these uh, quantum mechanics. Um, the continuous limit used by Feynman is not mandatory, except, and it's important, except to recover exactly the, the usual quantum mechanics predictions. But for n, the number of step n sufficiently large, we expect a discrete quantum mechanics that is empiri empirically equivalent to the usual quantum mechanics. And, and to defend this claim, it is, it, it is useful to, to present an analogy that Feynman makes uh, between the, the Riemann integral and his path integral. So the, the Riemann integral is a usual integral. Uh, it corresponds to the, to the area A under the curve. And similarly, the path integral is def uh, so, and, and this uh, Riemann integral is defined um, uh, by considering small rectangle re rectangles with uh, with h, and we make the sum of these rectangles, and we take the limit at the end of the, of the calculation. And similarly, the path integral is defined by considering a, a time step epsilon, and at the end of the calculation, epsilon goes to zero. So in this sense, both, uh, both the, the, the definition of the Riemann integral and the path integral are based on discretization and limiting process. However, there is an important difference. In the, the Riemann integral, the limit when h tends to infinity is well defined. The, the limit does exist, does exist. So we can, in that sense, the discretization disappears. But it, it is not the case with, uh, with path integrals. The limit when epsilon goes tends to zero is not well defined. In general, we have to keep the discretization step epsilon. Uh, and Feynman was fully aware aware of, of this problem already in his uh, seminal paper, he said there are very interesting mathematical problems involved in the attempt to avoid the subdivision and limiting processes. These curious mathematical problems are sidestepped by the subdivision process. However, one feels as Cavalieri uh, must have felt calculating the volume of a pyramid before the invention of calculus. So even if it leads to complicated uh, calculations involved by uh, discretization, we have to keep this discretization time step. It's true to define a path integral. Uh, I, here, uh, I, 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 I took a, a quotation in a, in a paper of Kevin Davy uh, on the mathematical rigor in, in physics, and uh, he says, it is unclear, however, how to construct the underlying measure dx, so the, the the, the, the measure in the path integral, um, relative to, to which the path integral needs to be defined. In fact, there are even theorems showing that in certain cases, one cannot define a path integral measure satisfying the requirement of the physicist. So, um, in the current state of science, it seems that we need a subdivision process in a discrete time representation to define the path integral. So, to define and, on, and also to, to compute path integral. Some textbooks decide to just uh, we mainly will use the lattice definition of the path integral to make a uh, computation. Um, just maybe two minutes and, uh, and I'm done. Uh, I would like to 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 answer your, your question with, with these two slides. Uh, exact does Feynman path integral lie on least discrete mechanics? Um, so we have, we have seen that least discrete mechanics does not involve a discrete time step epsilon. However, the Feynman path integral is based on the discrete time step epsilon. So for that reason, the Feynman integral does not generally rely on these uh, discrete mechanics. As I said, it, it is based on the discretization of the traditional usual Lagrangian theory, not the extended one. Uh, so in the, in the, therefore, in Feynman path integral, time is an evolution parameter and not a discrete not a dynamical uh, variable. However, we are not, we are not doomed to use uh, the traditional or usual Lagrangian theory. We can also formulate the path integral with a discrete extended Lagrangian mechanics. And as a matter of the history of physics, Feynman actually suggested this approach at the end of his paper in 1948. He claimed that the subdivision of time into equal intervals is not necessary 
the total action S must be now represented as a sum, and this sum, this discrete action, <coughs> is precisely that of least discrete mechanics. It is a discretization of the extended uh, Lagrangian theory. And in this condition, it seems that we can recover uh, the relationist viewpoint for time symbol with pass integral formalisms. We have a sequence of steps where the position and time are coordinates in the action used uh, to define path integral uh, integrals. Um, two slides and, and, and I stop. Uh, and again, one advantage of this approach is that time is treated on, is, is treated on the same footing as position. Uh, there is no longer a discrete time step but only a number n of discrete steps. And uh, as Rovelli and, and Vidotto stress in the loop quantum covariant loop quantum gravity books, at first this looks magic, this, this, this looks magic, the discretization of the Lagrangian does not depend on the lattice spacing, the number n appears only in the upper limit of the sum. Indeed, we, we recover the continuous case. Uh, to recover the continuous case, it's not required to that epsilon goes to zero, but only that the number of steps tend to infinity. So in, in Tsumdao Li's discrete quantum mechanics, we keep n large, large enough, but finite, and we expect to, to have uh, an empirical equivalent uh, theory. And to finish, to finish just uh, a diagram provided by, by Rovelli explaining the links between classical mechanics, quantum mechanics on the one hand, and continuous and discrete mechanics on the other hand. So two limits are involved. So the classical limit, which is a limit uh, when the constant, the Planck, const the Planck constant tends to zero, and the continuous limit, which is a limit where n, the number of steps, tends to infinity. So you, you, you should recognize, um, recognize uh, here, least discrete mechanics, um, discreti discretized classical theory SN, this is least discrete classical mechanics. When N goes to infinity, you, you, you recover the continuous extended Lagrangian mechanics with a Hamiltonian function, which is a function of Q and T. If you go to the quantum uh, case, you have the so you have the, the disc, you have a discrete quantum mechanics, least discrete quantum mechanics, which is uh, uh, so the, 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 the path integral formalism with, with the discrete extended Lagrangian mechanics, and you recover the continuous when, when, when you take the continuous limit, you recover the usual Feynman path integral uh, formalism. So uh, I will not discuss uh, the case of quantum gravity. Uh, and just maybe to, to sum up the two claims that I, that I, that, that I defended, but uh, I think it's quite uh, obvious now, so uh, I'm done. Thank you very much. So let's take five okay. and come back for the discussion.
thank you very much for, for this talk. And I, I'm supposed to ask you tough questions. And, uh, <laughs> since I agree with most everything you said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite embarrassed right now. But let, let's try. Anyway. So first question, about the holistic confirmation. Con this, I completely missed the argument, OK? Because if you refuse holistic confirmation, why should you accept this local confirmation? What, if if uh, holistic confirmation does not give me information about ontology, why this pseudo-local one should give me more about ontology? I think if you're skeptical, you're skeptical completely. And if you agree about, if you're a realist, you should be realist completely. You should trust, trust, trust empir empirical techniques. So I don't understand. Ah, I see that the argument is quite strong if you, if you say you don't even know how to test structure of time. Even if you, you but that's not a question between holistic and non-holistic. It's just that we don't even, it's difficult to imagine an experiment. Um, I'm not sure that uh, that that if we if we reject uh, holistic confirmation, we should also reject uh, local confirm confirmation. So it's, your, your question is uh, on Maddie's objection, if I if I understand the well. Uh, I, I'm I'm pretty agreement, maybe uh, we need more argument, but I'm pretty agree with the with the idea that that um, some excuse me um, that the use of some of some mathematical tools in physical theories does not play the, the role of physical assumptions. Okay. Uh, and and so I, but but actually. Uh, The, the, the distinction between holistic confirmation and local confirmation is, of course, not so easy to to do because all, in, in a sense, all empirical confirmation are holistic confirmation because you. But when you, for example, when, when you want to to test if uh, protons are made of quarks or if you want to test if uh, water is made of molecules. Um, you, you you don't just uh, see oh since uh, fluid uh, since uh, fluid mechanics work so it means that fluid is continuous uh, you will uh, you will try to to, to probe directly yeah exactly you uh, will never do that for time no actually yes yeah, I agree yes I, I, even if it's uh, it, 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 yeah, yes. So it's a strange metaphor between the structure of matter and the structure of time. Because structuring of matter, I can do something, I can throw, throw <laughs> atoms through molecules and look what happened. I cannot test structure of time directly. I perfectly agree with you. So what's the point to, for this weird discussion of matter? Because I'm surprised that it's matter. Okay, if it was someone else, but Mandy is a good philosopher. She would not say that for no good reason. So I, I, I try to understand. Please, I don't understand that. Right. So, so you would say that uh, we just don't have any possible uh, confirmation about the, the structure of time? This is I your think, idea? I think because direct, direct confirmation of the structure of time. It will always be indirect to, to look at dynamics of stuff directly the structure of them, I have no idea how you could do that. Yes, but does it mean that you... So so, so it's quite holistic all the time. So, so, so but, but you... It's not because... I, I agree with you, there is no uh, local confirmation. Uh, 
uh, just to clear that. But does it follow that we should endorse holistic confirmation of the, uh, the structure of time? Uh, maybe on time. We have to trust our best representation. Knowing what you said about the equivalence and it's tricky and maybe we should be, it's sometimes undecidable. But it's, it's a very strange kind of empirical inquiry to probe the structure of time. I would be very... If someone asked me how to do that, I would say, I have no idea. Actually, is, is, is a, so maybe there's... Yes, it's not. Uh, yeah, there are some some discussions about, about uh, some local some local investigations or about. Uh, I saw in LHC there was some some idea that shows some collision, so maybe you could have some indirect effect of, uh, about the screen time. Okay, I I, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, know. I, don't I, I just know that uh, there are some. At least speculative uh, works, but um, I have one extra slide about, about that because I knew that you will ask this question. <laughs> yeah. Um, slides. <laughs> extra slides. A lot of extra slides. You had drafts somewhere. I see that you work in the same laboratory that Philippe Mann, so you brought hundreds of slides <laughs> just in case. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. So this year. Okay. Um, so Marius Christo Doulou and colleagues uh, published a paper which, which is quite interesting. Um, they. But it's speculative. Um, they That's the they gravity effect. Wow. Okay. <laughs> they try to to imagine an experiment to to test the discreteness mm -hmm. of time in the context of uh, quantum gravity, and they show that it's not so far from uh, our technological uh, our technology uh, kind of setups. Uh, so it's uh, e e they use. Uh, an entanglement between two uh, two mass particles. Um, so I, I and they they show that the, the the difference of phase between the two uh, the two paths uh, can be proportional to uh, to to the Planck constant and. Um, they uh, they show that this kind of experiment could be, could, be could work in uh, maybe uh, thirty uh, maybe fifty years. It's, it's not so, uh, mm -hmm. so so far, but so it might it, it might exist a um, local experiment about uh, st the structure of time, and but I don't I don't know exactly how to I don't know exactly how to justify it. But I think this this kind of uh, confirmations are more convincing, convincing <laughs> than just an holistic confirmation by saying, oh, we have a, a, a theory which uses a continuous parameter, this theory works, so time should be con continuous. Um, be again, because I agree with Penelope Madi about the about space and time, which are not, uh, and all actually, all um, yeah, which are not exact, which are which are not exactly physical hypotheses in uh, in this series. They are they are mathematical tools to uh, use in, in physical theory, but. Of course, it depends on the interpretation of, uh, of, of the mathematical variables, but I think, I think this is that she, she has in mind when they make the distinction between, uh, between, uh, between, yeah, between physical hypotheses and uh, mathematical assumptions. Fair enough. I have another Sorry. question, comment, and after that, uh, Express themselves. So, um, 
I really like your talk, and especially the Marsden theorem that I didn't know. I have to check that because this is this is huge. This is major. This is something I don't know why it's not known in quantum gravity crowd, for example. This would be a strong reason to go to to prioritize the, uh, quantum loop contrary to uh, to superstring. But in a sense. Lee and all these guys, they just change subject. So, so that, it's not the problem in this of time anymore that was important for other people. And let me explain why. People that were interested in discretization of time in the 40s, for example, you know, like Feynman and that, they had in mind discrete succession of states. So there's continuous evolution of states in physics. Quantum mechanics will be a little bit more complicated. There will be some discretization of succession of states. So that's Anatolian formalism. When you go to Lagrangian formalisms, Lagrangian formalism, the essence of it is history, a uh, history. Beginning and end, stuff happening. There's no notion of states in Lagrangian mechanics. In fact, you can find when you come, when you do the, 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 the to do a, a rejection with the Hamiltonian to get the notion of states and succession of state, but in the Lagrangian, it's why it's so open to the extended version. It's very natural because you have the basic entity is history. It's already something extended in space and time. So to discrete that through the extended version is extremely useful for all kind of reason. Quantum gravity, but it is not exactly the project of the people that want the discretization of time before. It's it's discretization of tau, and tau is a free gauge, so it's something else. So I don't I see no I like the new project because the new project will get us maybe to quantum gravity, but I don't see how it's related to the ancient project about time as a real thing is discrete. Now it's the free gauge parameter that is discrete, which will get us to, 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 to interesting discreteness in the quantum field theory and in the quantum gravity theory after that, that we need, because it's a lattice and blah, blah, blah. blah. But it's, it's not, not discrete time like it was before. When so it looks to me like, like they changed the subject and they just didn't say it. They just said, follow us. And, but it's not the same subject at all. Maybe it's a better subject, they would say to me. And I agree. But it's not, it's not the, what was motivating people thinking about discreteness of time. But, but uh, what is uh, the ancient, ancient project you have in mind? I thought that the, the ancient project was people saying, OK, we have a lot of problem with continuous time because it's a differential equation, now we have to go to another project, which will be discrete time. Time itself, like space, will be discrete, like a, a lattice. Now it's a lattice, but in an abstract, ab abstract space of gauge parameters. Yeah, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm sorry. So is it about Lee's, uh, Lee's project or...? No, I think the Lee's project is not the continuation not of the ancient project. It's a new project. Yeah, but, but uh, what, do, what do you mean exactly by the ancient project? The Who project where space and time were real discrete entities. But who, now, for example? Huh? But who, who people found? Um, but Feynman himself was... Uh, was, was uh, joking with that at the beginning. And I think it's why people were fascinated by discretization of time and space, because they thought it was real discrete, real time and space. When it's the gauge parameter, as you said, Q and T take their values in the real. They are, they are not, they are, they are, they are not, they are not continuous, because when they are parameters, I mean, to the parameters, but they, they take their value in a continuous, Real. Yes, we're perfectly real. Yes. So it's an, it's another project. Actually, again, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what kind of project the two it projects, is. but um, again, this is the same answer to to Michel. Even if 
if uh, variables are real value parameters, they can be continuous or discrete. Yeah. In, in, the, in this project, uh, Q and T are discrete, even if they are real, even if they are real numbers. You know, be careful. They, they are not discrete. The dynamics is discrete. Because now they are dynamical variables that have steps in this gauge free parameter, which is not time. So it contrasts with a discrete Hamiltonian. Discrete Hamiltonian, you have a state, and you have another state, and it's discrete, and you have another state, blah, blah, blah. In this uh, gauge, uh, gauge uh, formulation, which is the good one, you know, for, for doing quantum gravity, you don't have, you have coordination between space and time, coordination between space and time, coordination, but since between them it's not even time, it's a gauge free para it's a gauge parameter. Because, yeah. It's not, it, it, maybe there's an order to the, these are not states, these are order, elements of reality, whatever that means. And when you switch to quantum mechanics, you have these transition element, transition elements, and you go to the to the discrete transition element, which okay. And when you go to the to the transition element in the quantum one, the one on the left on the on the square that you present, you don't have you don't have evolution at all here. You have only correlations between final and first day, first day, first day. Beginning and end of histories, that's it. You don't have evolution anymore. It's why there's some passage of Ravelli that are very puzzling about what is change in this version in the corner left, up corner left of your slides. Because change is supposed to be true in time, or at least time steps. Traditionally, maybe we were wrong. Okay, I think I, I, I have I, I, to I, think about it. But I don't know. I th I, it's up to you. I know it's a good question. I could because I agree with this thing. Okay, but no, fair enough. There is a question. Yeah, there is a follow-up. Thank you. So first of all, uh, I had had the same question because it seems to me that when you discretize the parameter, to what you're saying is uh, the. Well, the, 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 the space Q is continuous, <coughs> the time T is continuous, but we are sampling at a discrete ra rate, but fundamentally the mechanic behind is still continuous. Uh, and you, when you're discretizing the gauge, the, the, the gauge, you're just discretizing the sampling time. Uh, and since you could uh, change the parameterization and discretize against this new parameter, <coughs> like you're not even completely discretizing uh, the, the, the trajectory because you could, in theory, always change your parameter uh, enough to get all the disc all the continuous time in the So it seems to me that you, the thing that, uh, that you, you, you made a good account of like, they need a descri uh, description of time, in that you remove time from being a fundamental thing that acts on the system, and instead being simply a descriptor of order of the order of relation of things. Uh, but uh, at least to me, uh, the Leibnizian the notion is still compatible with continuous time, and uh, if you then uh, I'm not convinced we gain much by uh, having a description a discretization of the sampling uh, or uh, of the, the bar of the parametrization tone uh, instead of simply taking the continuous time because if you're still relying on the assumption that there's a fundamental continuous physics behind it, it's, uh, you don't need much or like, conceptually you don't need much. Right? Uh, thank you. I think there are a lot of things when you yeah. on what you said. Uh, first, I perfectly agree that the uh, Leibnizian viewpoint is compatible with uh, continuous time. Uh, what, I, what I said is, if you discretize, uh, if, you, if you use a discrete representation of time, 
it seems that you and, uh, and you and you and you want to have a good physical series with good equations, you should adopt the Leibnizian viewpoint. But I perfectly agree with the continuous uh, representation of time. You can either adopt uh, Newtonian or Leibnizian viewpoint. But about y y your first question or your first uh, comment uh, about just sampling or use discrete uh, series, I think it's a very important question, and it, it is related to the to the question whether discrete series are autonomous or independent from continuous uh, series. Um, in other words, does uh, does uh, discrete mechanics uh, need uh, a continuous theory to to exist and to to be formulated? Uh, and I think it's it's related to the to the quotation of to Lee's quotation when he says that let's start with uh, discrete equations and consider. Uh, Continuous equation are approximation of discrete equation, but is it possible or not? So the question is: Does discrete mechanics is autonomous, independent, uh, with respect to continuous mechanics? And I think it is. I thi and uh, again, in my PhD, I defended the claim that discrete mechanics is an autonomous theory. Uh, it's independent of uh, continuous uh, classical mechanics. And to support this claim, you, you is just a, a small argument is you, you just since you since you discretize the first principles, actually the, the least action the, the, the least action principle, uh, you don't need all the stuff of the continuous classical mechanics. If you, if if we are, if if we tend to regard uh, discrete mechanics as just a sampling continuous mechanics, is maybe just because we we learn before continuous mechanics. We of course we think uh, with a concept of uh, continuous mechanics, but try to to remove uh, all this uh, all this background and just start with a discrete least action principle, you can derive discrete Euler Lagrange equations and we don't need uh, the continuous uh, mechanics to, to, to derive uh, See, discrete Euler Lagrange ladder equations. Climbing it. Excuse me? You throw the ladder after climbing it. <laughs> I, I don't think, sorry, I don't You throw the ladder after climbing it, it's a catch time course. Okay. <laughs> So you use a tool then. Okay. Um, yes, maybe. maybe just just to complement, um, in the Lagrangian, not in the Hamiltonian, but in the Lagrangian, this is the more natural way to see Lagrangian. It's not not defining history through time, but defining history to to uh, anything because it's an order. Because time is inside the, the picture, is not from outside, contrary to Hamiltonian mechanics. So this is the natural way to understand Lagrangian, even in the continuous one. Even in the continuous one, that's that's the right way to understand Lagrangian. It's through this the, to see time as a permanent uh, dynamical variable. So the discreteness, as you said, as you said, could be could be from the start. But it's maybe not the discreteness that someone is looking for when they want discreteness of all the quantities or something like that. But but if you if you're a Lagrangian guy or girl, this is the way to go. It's Hamiltonian that you define you define change by uh, by change of states. Here, there's no states. So why not doing that? It makes sense. It's the more the good mathematical way to see Lagrangian mechanics. I think one of the problems that they, we say to every student in physics that these two formalisms are exactly the same. 
because they are isomorphic, but they are completely different, even if most of the time they give us the same answer. They are structurally different, mathematically different. And now we can, you convince us with the Marsden theorem that we should all be imagined. We should work in leverage in mechanics if we want the script this. Thank you for the talk, uh, very interesting. Uh, as far as I don't have much uh, questions because uh, I agree with most of what you said. Uh, one thing, uh, I really like what you emphasize the uh, distinction between what is the representation of time and what is physical time. I think uh, most of the issues we have in the future of space time is, uh, is, is because of this lack of distinction. But my question is uh, that uh, I'm quite disappointed that we didn't have time to talk about quantum gravity <laughs> more. Uh, uh, I was wanted to know if uh, this uh, program goes uh, end up in the same direction as uh, Rovis one because they start on the same direction, same uh, idea, and they have more or less the same end that you have discrete uh, like the lattice of the uh, horizontal level. So I was wondering if it's exactly the same program that you have in the end, or if there are differences that are interesting to. Uh, good question. And I have to say that uh, I'm not yet uh, familiar with Lee's uh, 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 with the quantum gravity in Lee's project, so it's a, it's, it's a for future. But just maybe I, I can I can say that uh, they are uh, these are two different uh, directions. Um, in a sense. Um, why? Uh, I mean, for for, for several uh, reason, reasons. Mm. But maybe well, I, I don't want to, to say uh, to say. Uh, the first difference that I see is that in. In Lee's uh, quantum gravity, we have a fun fundamental length L, uh, which is introduced to, to remove the ultraviolet divergences. And I think it's not the case in, uh, in loop quantum gravity. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, after the reintroduce, when you have all these spikes and stuff, you introduce uh, some cutoff in length to remove the uh, divergences. No? Well, in the yeah. atomical, in the chemical kind of variable version, at the end, uh, after all the recalculus stuff, he has to introduce some cutoff to avoid the spice uh, of the divergences in this lattice. Okay, you, you have a natural way to get rid of the, of the, of the pipe on the spike because it's discrete. Um, okay, I have to 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 to, okay. to give you a, a good answer, but just uh, another another answer is. Um, it seems to me that, but it's a, it's a question of interpretation uh, and not a question maybe of, uh, of theoretical uh, results. Lee's is tend to interpret realistically the discretization of uh, space-time, the discretization of space-time in, in his uh, discrete quantum gravity. Conversely, I think it's not the case in Rovelli's uh, view. Uh, and there are a couple of quotations of Covelli when he says that quantum gravity is often confusing. The discretization used to define uh, boundary amplitudes is often confused with the quantum discreteness of space. Or the use of discreteness of space is not given by the fact that we use discretization in the theory. So com com if, if we compare Lee's and Rovelli's quantum gravity, it seems that unlike uh, Tsung Daoli, Rovelli does not see any possible realistic in interpretation of discretization. But it's maybe maybe it's just a matter of interpretation and, and not uh, say what you call uh, differences. And I, but maybe uh, so maybe uh, I'm completely wrong. But I th I think that Lee's quantum gravity uh, corresponds to. Uh, is uh, 
is close to lattice uh, quantum gravity, while Gravelli's uh, quantum gravity uh, do, does not fit with uh, with lattice uh, lattice theory, because there is no uh, lattice uh, uh, step in in Gravelli's uh, theory. But so we have to 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 read yeah. more about that. No, but it's a good point. Discretization come later in the early, not at the beginning of the theory. Mm -hmm. But if they get to the same theory, that would be interesting. That would be mm -hmm. an mm -hmm. interesting physical question of what, how, which one should we interpret mm -hmm. in which way. Yes, because the, 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 inter the interesting point is that they start both with the time as a dynamical uh, variable. Thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe zooming out just a bit, trying to to see what what the take home message here would be. Because it seems that you you're supporting this project that it seems to be possible to reformulate all these physical theories, whether classical quantum or quantum gravity, by discretizing time. Would you then say that whether time is continuous or discrete is a convention? Would that be... Is that kind of the claim? Uh, my claim is that the representation that the is continuous or as discrete is a convention. If you want to push me. Yeah, I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm still confused between that distinction because, because I was I was making the analogy with, with the discussion on whether in a special relativity whether simultaneity this and simultaneity is a convention or not. And there, those who seem to defend the idea that the notion of this and simultaneity is, is conventional can read it in two ways. So they can either read it epistemically or ontically. And it seems to be similar to one of the slides you showed by Newton Smith, I think, where he said that either there's just no empirical way for us to to, to, to verify this claim, and we'll never know whether two events are simultaneous or not. But there is a fact of the matter as to whether they are simultaneous or not. Whereas the only claim would say that there's just no such thing as distant simultaneity, and there is no matter of the fact whether two events are simultaneous. And so you could apply the same here. Either we, we just have no way of verifying the, the, the structure of time, or you may say, you take it ontically like, like most people subscribing to the convention of simultaneity do, that there's just no matter of fact about the discrete or continuous nature of time. Which in this case seems to me quite strange. So, mm. yeah. When I s you, you push me to say that... Uh, uh, <laughs> push you to say something. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like it at all. <laughs> that that the, the, the representation of time is the continuous representation of time is a convention. Maybe it's a, sh it's a, it's a way of speaking. The, I mean the the, represent, the continuous representation of time is a maybe see as a conventional framework to. Uh, to, to describe physical phenomena. So it's not a convention <coughs> in itself, the continuous representation of time, but it's a framework. And this framework, we, we can use it or not. We can use this framework or another framework. In that sense, it might be viewed as conventional, even if it's not a convention to say time is continuous, uh, the representation of time is continuous. Mm. But I don't know if it is. A yeah, but it seems to me that you want to resist going from there to any deep metaphysical conclusion about time itself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. And, and, and is it the same with Lee? Um, I'm not sure. No, I think... Uh, I think... Uh, no, yes. I think Lee's... Lee... Uh, He's taking it much more realistically. Uh, yes. Can you show the, uh, the, the, the theorems 
theorems the the theorems? The theorems. The master. Okay. Why is it? I'm lost in my slides. Yes. Yes. Before. Oh. Before. I think so. So you stop, because I. I no 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 it's after sorry. Because I have no slide on about the theorem. Like okay, yeah, you mentioned this one. Yes, this one. This one I mentioned it, okay. and, and another one. Okay. Uh, uh, I have so, a, I have a so according to 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 Marsden, Marsden uh, 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 theorem, um, the the usual uh, formulation, which is which presupposes a, a continuous time, right? The preferable formulation is, is it continuous time or not? No, no, uh, uh, I mean, uh, among all, among different uh, way of, uh, among diff different discretizations, the, prefer the, the preferable formula discrete formulation is uh, the variation, the, the variation of one. Yeah, oh, okay, all right, yes, yes, all right. More precise, yeah. Uh, but I, I have a, a paper with uh, Anouk Barbaros on the discrete representation okay, of time, okay, and okay. we have a section so about maximize the number of symmetries and conservation laws with respect to other uh, discrete, discrete, exactly. discrete formulations. Yes. yes. But then, uh, uh, these uh, 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 symmetries and conservation laws are the same as the ones that we get from uh, a continuous approach of time. So there is equivalence at this, at this level. Mm -hmm. It, there is an equivalence between uh, uh, the, the this discrete the preferable uh, formulation, uh, which is which uses a discrete time on the one hand, and on the other hand, the uh, usual formulation uh, of uh, mechanics by means of a continuous time. There's a, there's a, yes. Yes. Okay. So there is no way empirically you know, to decide on the basis of uh, symmetries and conservation conservation laws for which we have some uh, empirical evidence to decide between the, the discrete and continuous. And that's continuous what I can ask. Okay, okay. Okay. Now I have another, uh, uh, another question. Maybe just in dif one difference, but mm. it's not an empirical, yeah. an empirical difference, uh, is that in the discrete case actually Tau or the discrete tau uh, is not a free is no longer a free gauge. So you break you break uh, the invariance from the reparameterization reper when you discretize it. Mm -hmm. But you can recover it uh, in three cases: in the infinite limit, in the free particle system, or in another case, which is pretty tricky, Gravelli calls it perfectation. You can always find a, a way to, to express your Lagrangian in a discrete way to uh, recover invariance of the parentization, but it's not a natural way to, to have a, 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 a gauge, of, gauge of parameter. But, okay. sorry. But the other question is that uh, it's, it's uh, continuous with, uh, with what uh, uh, Alexandre said. Um, you said that uh, the uh, uh, discrete approach uh, is more congenial with a, a relation, a relational view of time, and you say a Leibnizian view of time. But if you take the customary uh, Leibnizian approach, then the relation, the relation, uh, relation of time uh, is uh, is based on on states, okay, on events uh, which are, are states. And uh, here, uh, the discrete the, the, the discrete uh, rising is is not based on states. Uh, it's based on something something else. And uh, so you can ask what kind of reality uh, are this uh, 
correspond to this something else. Because, of course, Leibniz worked in a, in a, in a conventional framework, there were states, you know, following each other, and, but the Lagrangian formalism is a holistic, uh, it's a holistic approach with no states. So what does, does, does it mean to have a relational uh, uh, theory of time, a Leibnizian theory of time, within uh, this uh, uh, holistic Lagrangian approach? Good point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, that's, that's what you yeah, said. I think that's a good yeah, idea. Yes, yes, yes. If, if, if you define a philosophy where time is related to change, for example, that yeah. Yeah. maybe they are not the same, but they are closely related, mm -hmm. and you have something that it's not obvious what is change in uh, the Lee, uh, the Lee formulation of, uh, of mechanics. It's not, it's not obvious. It's probably you can interpret some kind of change, but it's not obvious because now the the, the order of step constituting a history are just an an order. So, so someone that would say for me, time and change must be together. Not obvious uh, how it would. And when you put the, 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 the four theories, uh, there's a weird, uh, an interesting but weird passage of Rovelli about discussing exactly the, the, new, uh, the new conception of, uh, of uh, transition element, discrete transition element, where he says, we recover a new notion of change. There's no explanation there, but he obviously feel, felt in the book that he had to say something because it looks like change disappear of the theory, and he wants to say that physics is about change. So he said we have a new notion of change, which are represented by these transition, discrete transition, amplitude. What does typical? What kind of change is it? I don't know. It's an, it's an interesting claim. At least it's very interesting. But us, for philosophers, it's difficult to connect it to other other notion of change. And maybe an interesting, another interesting project would be to to study uh, what happens when you discretize the extending Hamiltonian formalism. Maybe you. Yeah. But. Uh, you convince us it's not the right way to go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you for the comments. I agree with you. Thank you. <laughs> Last question before the beer. Maybe just if I if I can, I have a last question. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the tables have turned. <laughs> <laughs> because to, to, I have to be fair. <laughs> And actually, I think uh, there is a, an objection to, to to what I said, and I have an extra slide about <laughs> because uh, I would like to object to, to my own talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a recent paper, Butterfield and Butterfield and Docker uh, just mentions uh, the frame and pass in, in integral, and, and they say that. Um, that it's not uh, discrete at all. It's just uh, piecewise uh, piece wise continuous uh, function. So it's not uh, discrete. There is no discrete physics. There is just uh, uh, non-differential physics, but everywhere continuous because uh, functions are everywhere continuous, even not differential at the at, at the corner. So. Maybe uh, I have to, to answer to this objection and say, uh, because I think it's, it's, it's almost the same in, dis in least discrete mechanics. Uh, do we have discrete uh, sequence or do we have uh, piecewise straight line? Okay, so just. I can, we can just answer that first. I do not argue for discrete physics, but just a discrete representation of time. But is it really a discrete representation of time or just a dis maybe a discontinuous representation of time? Um, so yes, I have to, to think about it uh, in what sense it is really discrete and not just um, discontinuous. So not discontinuous, continuous, but not differentiable. differentiable. 
question. Which was my last question, if you have uh, an answer. Okay. No. <laughs> Because uh, I was wondering what the, ex the domain of uh, the foundation that you were, that were considered. Because as uh, I said earlier, technically, a bit foundation is a discrete foundation of mechanics. It can, can take as a discrete foundation of mechanics. Because you have states uh, discrete in one sky or another. So I was wondering if it was part of the lesser concept of preserved, one of these foundations that preserved less. Is the rationalism like the discrete mechanical change? Or is it absolutely out of the field of the domain of the field? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I have to guess. Because technically, uh, well, I mean, we are using the mechanical mechanics all the time, and the theorem is the same as the mechanical mechanics. So if, it, if, if, if the theorem says that uh, discrete mechanics is better or has learning for the position of the bad mechanics itself, it's kind of strong in this Yes, um, I have to, yeah. to look at it. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. No, Thank you very much for the talk. <laughs> 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 <laughs>